tonight we're talking about something, obviously from the Word of God, but in ministry, there's these various seasons that we have. You know, there's seasons where you're doing a lot of Bible studies, seasons where you're doing a lot of funerals. Well, for me lately, it's been a season of weddings. Over the past several months, I've did about five different weddings. I've officiated, and it's been so cool. It's been so awesome to be able to do that. And I've learned and observed a couple of things. So can I share a couple of things with you? Is that okay? Okay. So a couple of things I learned that every wedding is different. It's diverse, right? From the number of attendees to the location, each of the five weddings I've done, they've been in five different places. One in San Marcos, one in Fillmore, one in Long Beach, uh, one here, and one right here in a very own sanctuary. So all of them were different. And not only were they different, from the actual ceremony, there were some where the bride was walking down, she was crying. There were some where the groom was waiting for his bride and he was tearing up because guys don't cry. They just tear up, right? Um, there were some where they both smile. Just a, a variety of responses from the exchange of vows to the rings to even the kiss. All of them were different. But as I look back over these five weddings I've officiated, there's one common denominator. And, and one of the things I get to do is, and I officiate weddings, I get to pray with the bride and the groom before they get married, before they see each other for the very first time. And it's such a cool thing to be there. And I go in and they're all nervous. They got the nervous butterflies. You know how that is? It's just like, and they're nervous and anxious. How do I look? And doing all this kind of stuff. But one thing I've noticed across the board and maybe over all the weddings I've done, when I've walked to see and pray for the bride, I knock on the door, I open the door. The bride is always ready. She's ready to go, right? What do I mean by that? When I walk in, she's not brushing her teeth, you know? She's not getting a pedicure. She is ready. She is waiting. And as I think about this, I think about even for ourselves here, this bride, and the funny thing is, she doesn't just wake up one day, ta-da, I'm a bride. She takes days and weeks to get ready. Any, any former brides in the house of God, right? She gets a foot scrub, she gets a pedicure, manicure, she gets a eyebrow threading. You guys know what that is? I just found out what that is, right? Um, she, she does her hair, she gets highlights. And not only that, physically that, where she, she actually makes herself fit. She does Zumba, she does CrossFit, she goes on a diet, right? But all of them were believing women of God, so they obviously, not only physically, but spiritually, they, they got into the word, and, and they got prayed over, and they were in fellowship. So each of these women were ready for the day. Even some of them, actually all of them, had a special makeup artist on the day of. That's kind of interesting. They needed an artist to help them, right? So a special makeup artist and a hairstylist. So for this one day, and what do they do it for? For one man, for their man, for their groom, correct? That's what it, it's all this primping and this beauty is all for this one man and this one woman. This, this moment that they have. But every single time, the wife, the bride was always ready. Tonight, we're going to look at a passage in Matthew chapter 25. It's a parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. That word virgin, you can translate it to maidens or bridesmaids, however you want to look at it. Uh, back in the day, most uh, bridesmaids were virgins that they had given them over to themselves to purity. So here they are. And as we look at this passage, I want us to think of a couple of things as we look at this and read through this. Uh, tonight's Bible study is called, Ready or Not, Here He Comes. And that he, capital he, is referring to Jesus. Uh, how many church, you, you know that Jesus is coming soon, right? You know he's coming soon and you know that he is ready to do some things here. Jesus, he's coming soon. Coming attractions, Jesus is coming back for you and me. And the question we have tonight is, don't get left behind. Don't get up, be ready for his coming because he's coming soon. In Matthew chapter 25, if, if you're there, let me see your word. Let me see your word. If you know I want, get the one in front of you. All right, just pretend. All right, everyone has their Bible. Good. Matthew 25 verses 1 through 13 says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. 
Those who are foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No less there should be not enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for themselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Verse 11. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. And, and God, your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And so God, today we pray that you would illuminate, show us, God, exactly what you want from us tonight. God, we don't want to be a bunch of people who attend church out of obligation, but we want to come to church out of devotion for you, God. So thank you so much for what you want to continue to do in our hearts tonight. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Would, would you speak to our hearts? And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Prior to chapter 25, chapter 24, Jesus is speaking his his. Uh, discourse on the Mount of Olives, and he's there, and he's talking about some heavy, intense subjects. He, he's talking about the Son of Man coming. He's talking about the tribulation, the signs of the times, the end of the age. So Jesus is laying out all these things that are to come. And as he lays out these things that are to come, he ends it with this practical application and this parable. That word parable means to, to tell, to cast out, to come alongside. So he lays out all these things that are to come, and he says, now here's a story. And this story is not about them, but the story is about you, about us. In this parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. And I love this because parables are meant, intended to drive a point across. And the point for us tonight, it's real simple, it's two words, be ready. Be ready for Jesus coming soon. And I love it because that's, that's a personal question. I cannot look upon you and say, you're ready, you're not ready, you're ready, you're not, I, I don't know. But you know who knows? Jesus does. So in this parable in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus lays out this story, this story that, that, allows us to see where we stand with the Lord. But it's interesting that Jesus knows us, doesn't he? Uh, how many here, uh, let's say, are punctual? Any punctual people here? On time, all the time? Well, that's not very many. How many here are always, always late but worth the wait? Raise your hand. All right. Okay, good, good, good. So, so you are here tonight with my disease, yes, uh, the lateness disease. So you understand what that is to be late. And, and God knows his people, doesn't he? All throughout history, he would send prophets, he'd send his word. And the people, they would not change, correct? The nation of Israel, right? He would give them warnings and signs and they remain the same in sin. In the days of Noah, if you look at Luke chapter 17, right? It says uh, they, they drunk, they, they got married, and when the floods came, the door was shut. There came a time when there was no longer entrance for salvation in Noah's day. And as I think about it, there will come a time for all of us when for Noah it was the ark that was shut, but for us salvation. And so as we look at this uh, parable in depth, I pray that you would learn what God is trying to speak to your own heart. I don't know where you are with the Lord today, but he knows where you are with the Lord tonight. And even as we're, we're worshiping earlier, I was just being reminded, God, would you speak? Speak to my heart, speak to our hearts tonight, God, that we would hear your voice clearly. A lot of us, there's a lot of noise. Anyone hear some noise lately? 
things that aren't of God, but it's like static and just you're not able to hear him clearly. I pray that as we look at the word of God tonight, that we would clearly say, are we the wise or are we the foolish? And if we're the foolish tonight, help us become wise. Help us not to be of that, that group there. In order for us to understand this, we have to see what the word of God says. It says, Then the kingdom of God shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. In order to understand this, we need to understand Jewish tradition when it comes to marriage. There are three stages. The first stage would be the engagement. And this is where two families will look at their son and the other family will look at their daughter. It's like, mmm, I spy with my little eye. I, li I like what I see. I like what I see there. And they have what's called an arranged marriage. I like that idea. How many parents like that idea, right? You get to choose your, sp your child's spouse, right? My daughter's only four years old, but you better believe I want some input on who's going to take care of my baby girl one day, right? And so as I think about this, I think even in that, someone told me that there's a reality show that's called Married at First Sight. How many of you guys have heard this? Don't watch it. Okay, so anyway, but what it is, these relationship counselors, they go through a pool of people and they pick two people out of this male and female pool of, of, or catalog and they say these two are going to be the most compatible. You know how they meet? They meet on their wedding day. They're total, complete strangers, and they don't even know who they're marrying. Talk about arranged marriage, right? Re <laughs> leaving it up to some relationship counselors who know nothing about you to pick your spouse. And I think they live together for six weeks, and at the sixth week, they can decide whether to continue with the marriage or get a divorce. Check this out. You and I were prearranged to be the bride for our bridegroom, and his name is Jesus. That's the only arranged marriage I'm, I'm talking about tonight. That's the one that I want. That's the one I live for. And so for each of us, as we look at these passages, that we would see the difference in our own lives. One of the things that says here tonight is that, verse 2, now five of them were wise and five were foolish, right? So as we look at this, there is the engagement process. But then after that was the betrothal. This is when there would be a ceremony where they basically say this man and this woman is intended for each other. And so they get to date. But they date with a chaperone. They date with a third wheel, right? The, 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 the woman is still living in her father's home, but the man, he is building a home typically attached to his father's house one day. And a year after comes the marriage. That means the home is ready. It's built ready for a wife to be in that home. So after a year uh, of this betrothal to the marriage, he'll come back. And he's able to come back within a 24-hour period. And within this 24-hour period, uh, their day started at sunset. So he could come at 6.05, or he could come at 12.05, or he could come at 2.34 in the morning in this period of time. Well, let me, let me ask you, brothers, if you waited a year to marry a woman, would you wait till 634 in the morning to see her? No. But it's typically at the night when he would come. And what would happen was there would be a trumpet, an announcement, da, 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 the bridegroom is here. And what these maidens, these bridesmaids, these virgins would do, they would get their lanterns and would come on out they do a little procession. And back in the day, as you know, uh, John chapter 2 talks about Jesus at the wedding, right? A wedding was a community event. It was everybody and their grandma, right? They were involved. So when the bridegroom would come for the bride, they would have this great procession. And they would end up at the father's home. At the father's home, they would go in, the bride and the groom, and they would consummate the marriage. And they would come out as husband and wife. In this, the Bible says there are five that were wise and five that were? Five that were, read it, foolish. foolish. As I think about this, what differentiated the two? The foolish had no oil, right? And the wise had oil. That was the difference between the two. As I start to think about this, here is an opportunity for us to be either wise or foolish. And I love the Bible. Any average C students in the house of God tonight? 
I'm not an overachiever. I, I, I'm, I'm good with a C. Sometimes a C minus that type of student I was, right? The Bible is simple. Jesus, what did he talk about? He talked about the broad road versus the narrow road. He talked about the light versus the darkness. Contrast, correct? In here he's contrasting wise and foolish. Matthew chapter 7. Most of us know this story about the wise man who built his house upon a rock and the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And when the winds and the rains came, the man who built his house on the sand, the house came what? Tumbling down. But the man... The wise man, not the foolish man, the wise man who built his house upon the rock, his house stood firm. Whenever you see contrast between wise and the foolish, my prayer, our prayer should be, God, help me to be wise. Help me to be a wise guy in a good sense, right? Help me to understand that this is what you want from me, not to be foolish. So the difference between these two groups, and it's 50-50, Right? It would be like 50%, I'm not going to say who's foolish, but 50% would be one way and the other 50% would be another way. Correct? And I love this because the only differentiating factor was one group had oil and the other didn't. Centuries ago, in order to have a lamp or a lantern, oil was necessary in order to light a lamp or a lantern. So you see that oil was absolutely necessary in this. And as I start start to think about this, if these five foolish virgins knew that the bridegroom was coming, think about this, they already knew he was coming, they just didn't know at what time. Why wouldn't they have the oil? Right? It would make sense. Here the bridegroom's coming within a 24-hour period. Well, it makes sense that I should be ready. Anyone here a procrastinator? Mm, all right, you're foolish then. Okay, no, just okay, but that's, that's, that's the disease that's going on here, correct? They have the thought, I'll have time later, correct? There's always tomorrow. Or maybe they're not even thinking ahead, right? You ever moments where you have a lapse of, mani- uh, a, a lapse of your memory and you don't even think ahead? Uh, ladies, let me tell you, uh, ladies, if you have a husband or, you know, a brother, right, and you ask him a question, what are you thinking about? He's going to say, nothing. And like, no, 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 really, what are, you, what are you thinking about? You can't be thinking nothing. He's like, no, I'm thinking nothing. <laughs> Ladies, he's really thinking nothing. There's nothing going on in there, right? And we have moments where we're not thinking ahead. Or better yet, maybe they're just living for the moment. Living for the here and now, the temporary. What is right in front of me? Sounds very familiar with our world today. Living for the here and now. Living for what feels good right now. And the difference between the wise and the foolish was what they had. Those who had the oil and those who didn't have the oil. Oil, as we said, as you know, all throughout the Bible, oil is representative of the Holy Spirit. Every time you see oil mentioned, especially in Zechariah chapter 4, when it talks about the oil, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, in order for the lamp, the lantern to be lit, there had to be oil. Without the oil, the virgins, the bridemaids, would not be ready for the bridegroom. Without the Holy Spirit in our life, there would be no way for us to be ready for the return of Jesus. Couple scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 says this. Who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Paul talking to the Corinthian church, he says, the Holy Spirit is a guarantee. It's a stamp. You are sealed. You are guaranteed. You belong to Christ. This morning, if you hear Pastor Jeff talked about baptism and identifying ourselves with Christ. The Holy Spirit is evidence that he's living in you. Galatians chapter 5, 22 talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, gentleness, self-control, right? And as it goes on, it says, but without the Holy Spirit, how can we be ready for the return of Jesus? 
Ephesians chapter 1, 13 says, In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Do you realize the day that you accepted Christ, our Father God sealed you with the Holy Spirit, identifying you as belonging to God. As I, as I think about this, there are days when I am full of the Holy Spirit. And there are days when there is very little. And on those days when there's very little, I ask God, fill me. And maybe that's you tonight. Maybe you, you, you want to be wise. You want to be wise and have oil in your lantern like these wise virgins. But maybe you're running out. Maybe that's why you're here tonight. Maybe tonight is all about you fueling up. All about you being filled. All about you being touched by the Spirit of God so that might you continue Monday morning. That you might continue Tuesday night. That you might continue. As believers, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. I love it. Salvation is not a possibility. It's a promise. Because you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So first thing I want to share with you tonight is... Um, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we need to check yourself. It says here in 2 Corinthians 13, 15, 13 5, it says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? There used to be this saying that says, check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? And it was actually taken out of a, uh, a company that did car brakes, and it's talking about better check your brakes before you wreck yourself, and the rule has kind of changed it around. Well, the whole idea is before I can judge and look at anybody else, I need to check myself. I need to examine myself. If you're really good with your health, you get a self-examination at the doctor once a year. He checks your blood. He checks your pulse. He checks your heart. He makes sure you're doing okay, and sometimes we get a good report, and sometimes you don't get a, we don't get such a good report, Correct? And while it's dependent on is what you're taking in, what your diet is like, if you're exercising in the same way, how do you know you're ready for the return of Christ? How do you know you're ready for the bridegroom? How do you know that Jesus is coming and you'll be ready for him? Check yourself. Paul, as he was writing to the Corinthians here, he shared real simply uh, that he asked these Corinthian Christians to consider and ask yourself, Am I really a Christian? That's a simple question to ask each of ourselves. And if I ask you today, who here is a believer in Jesus Christ? Oh, amen. Who here is going to heaven? Oh, amen, right? But I say, if I say, who here is faking it? Raise your hand, come on, right? Who here is trying to be a poser, a pretender in being a Christian? None of us would. But I love it. Man sees it outward, but God sees the heart. And he knows. And so this message, this, this part here that we need to check ourselves is really the heart behind it is that we would examine ourselves. And not to assume or presume because of church attendance or because I give a tithe or because I have a Bible and it's engraved with my name. That all this should give me entrance into heaven. The number one factor I need to ask, have I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart? And what is the evidence that you and I are believers? That I see Jesus in you. That you see Jesus in me. Right? That as we look at the world, there's a difference. Thinking about uh, uh, differences, that we should see difference, differences in each other. That's different from the world. The way that Christianity, that believers interact should be different. And if there's not a difference... Ask the Lord to make a difference in ourselves so that people can see. As I was mentioning, uh, my daughter Shiloh, uh, we have a friend, and they adopted an older dog. And they were over the house, and uh, my daughter was asking uh, our friend, oh, why did they give away the dog? You know, it's old, it can't see. And uh, our friend says, well, you know, maybe they didn't want to take care of it, and maybe they didn't want to love on it, right? And that was the key word, they didn't want to love on it. And so my daughter said, oh, is it because they don't know Jesus? In her mind, if you know Jesus, love Jesus, then you're a believer. And I love that. 
They will know we are Christians by our love for one another. How, how's your love doing? How's your love doing for the person in your household? How's your love doing for that unlovable in your workplace? How's, how's that going lately? And maybe as we check ourselves, we check those attributes about us that God is working on. Oftentimes we have to ask ourselves, Lord, is there anything I'm doing in my life that's grieving you? That's grieving your Holy Spirit. God, the way that I conduct myself, the way that I speak to people, the way that I act towards one another. Lord, would you check my heart? Would you see those things that are there? Psalm 26.2 says, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. Psalm 139 says, Search me and know me and know my anxious thoughts. There's all kinds of people, and, and anyone can be religious, correct? Anyone can go to church. And maybe we think that's what we need. Uh, one of my favorite Bible expositors, uh, J. Vernon McGee, he breaks it down this way. He says there's three kinds of people. Those that are, those that ain't, and those who think they are, but they ain't. I pray we're not of that third. That we think and we presume because of my family status and my grandparents who were pastors or, or the bumper sticker on my car or because people know me at church, that this qualifies me entrance into heaven. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, then we will be saved. And I pray that for each of us. I pray that every single one of us in the house of God tonight, that you already know, you're rest assured, your salvation is secure, that you're going to heaven. But with that, I want to ask yourself, ask yourself, right? If the Holy Spirit is in us, if we have the oil, remember our story about the parable of the virgins, right? Is there light coming from my life? Is there warmth, right? I love uh, interacting with people who are very hospitable and they're very compassionate. You know how this, oh, hi and they give you the hug, not the calorie side hug, you know, there's like, oh, loving on you and all this kind of stuff. But then you know what it is to meet someone who's cold. Hi. Right. Hi. Right. You know what I mean? Just this, this, this real, man, church, I pray that we be a church that be inviting, that would be warm, that would be compassionate, that people would see who it is that we serve. As we continue, Verse 5 says, But while the bridegroom delayed, they all slumbered and slept. I like this. The bridegroom delayed. He was late. He, can, he, he didn't come on time or when they thought he would, but he came at an hour when they didn't expect him. If you ever had to wait for somebody after a period of time, right, and it's late at night, the tendency for us is what? To nod off. How many of you ever... Confess. How many here have been in a prayer time late at night and you fell asleep? Right? How many have been in the daytime and you fell asleep, right? Especially with the brothers and sisters who love to pray. I'm guilty. I pray long, right? But, but you're praying, oh, right? And it's warm, right? And, and they have a monotone voice. No, 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 right? And all of a sudden you do one of, you know, do one of those, right? I remember one time we were in the Philippines. We were in this little jeepney. And I was so tired, and I think we were praying, and I was holding on to the bar like this. And, and I kid you not, I, I, we hit a bump, we're like, praise the Lord. You know, I was, I was asleep, I was like, praise the Lord, I don't know what we're praying. And we're like, we weren't praying, we were worshiping. I'm like, oh, okay. So, so what does this all mean? I'm reminded of the disciples in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus brought the three, Peter, James, and John, sit here, pray, lest you enter in temptation. And what do they do? They snooze. They fall asleep. They nod off. And Jesus comes like, ay, 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 what happened? He says what? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, these bridesmaids, these virgins, think it. It's not just the foolish who fell asleep. The wise fell asleep also. So remember there's a difference. The wise and the foolish. The wise with the oil, the foolish without the oil. But here, the bridegroom is delayed, and they all fall asleep. 
they all fall asleep in the midst of that. And as I think about this, part of it is that he won't come yet. The bridegroom, he's still probably building the roof. It'll take him a couple of hours. So let me, just, let me just relax for a bit. Be very, very careful. Remember David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, he was supposed to be out. It was war season, but he decided to stay home. He's decided to, to relax, to, to, to kick back. And in the midst of that, that's what led to his sin. I read this quote. It says, the enemy can't fool us and say that there's no God. The enemy can't even fool us by saying that there's no hell. But the enemy can fool us and tell us that there's no hurry. Relax. Don't worry about it. You'll have enough time. Your family and friends, they can wait. Talk to them about Jesus next week. Tell your coworker who's going through a tough time. Say you'll pray later. Put it off. The devil is good at that, isn't he? Do it tomorrow. What if tomorrow never comes? So what's going on here is they slept as they slumbered, right? He basically told them, you have time. James tells us what? Chapter 4, you're but a vapor here today and gone tomorrow. And the older that I get, more and, people, more and more people start to, to fall off the map of life, right? If you're over the age of 40, those people that you were with at, when you're 20 years old, slowly but surely, right? Grandparents, aunts, and uncles. I think I, on my mom's side, a majority of them are widows or widowers that their spouse has gone to be, right? And so as I think about this, the older we get, now more and more that happens, Verse 6 says, I love this, At midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. I love this. Now comes midnight, and the bridegroom is there. There's this announcement, and they all arose. They all got up. Isn't that the worst thing? When you've overslept? When you didn't hear your alarm? And you're late for work, right? And as they woke up, they arose, and it says they trimmed. That word trimmed, uh, I think, is uh, cosmeo, something like that. But it's the same where we get our word cosmetics. So what they did, they, they trimmed, they prepared, they adorned, they got their lanterns ready. And the wise were ready, and the foolish weren't. See, the foolish decided to procrastinate and wait for a later time. But the wise were ready. Remember, they all slept. And the only difference was one was ready and one wasn't ready. And that oil being a representative of the Holy Spirit. The lamps with the oil, their lamps were lit. Those who didn't have the oil, their lamps were not lit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14 says, Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Ready or not, here he comes. He's coming. He's coming for his church. And we are one day closer to Christ's coming than we were yesterday, correct? Or is one day closer to that return? Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. And as I think about this, Lord, help me to be ready. The foolish go to the wise, give us some of your oil. The wise kind of scratch your head. Well, if we give you some of ours, then we won't have enough for both of us. So they tell them, go. Go and find uh, someone to buy from. And, and when I think about this, it says in verse 9, but the wise answer is saying, no lesser should be not enough for us, but you go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. I liken this to maybe families or, or friends. You cannot play off of your brother's or your sister's Christianity. The Holy Spirit is within me. I can't give you the Holy Spirit, right? That's something that you personally obtain by right relationship with God, by accepting him into your life. That's not something I can do for you. 
but that's something you do for yourself. And I love the simple fact that the Holy Spirit is so personal, isn't he? He knows you intimately. He knows all those things about your life. And I love it. Right now, he knows what you need. He knows exactly what you need. And the only way to be ready is by asking Christ into our life. Verse 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. So those that were ready, those who had awoken and trimmed their lamps, they were ready for the bridegroom. One thing I want to share with you, though we not know the hour of the day, uh, we need to do this. We need to be ready for Christ's return. Uh, the second thing I want to share with you is to check yourself, but also to seize the day. Carpe diem in Latin, right? Ephesians 5.16 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. To redeem the time, make sacred use of those opportunities that were given. To understand what God has done. That light that he has given us is there for a purpose. That we will walk wisely and not unwisely. That word for time, when it says redeeming the time, it's not like a time of day, it's not like an hour, but the time, the season that we're in. Aren't we in some interesting times, folks? Right? I'm not even just talking about the presidential election and our government, but just we're in interesting times where there's mass shootings and natural disasters. There are just things going on in this time that's unlike any other days. Other, other seasons, things that you can't even explain. Sometimes when you watch the news, like, what just happened? How did that? And there's things that happen to you in people's lives. It's like, what? Why? What Paul's saying in the Ephesian church, he says, walk wisely, not foolishly. Redeeming time. Not making most of time, but making most of the time. We are in an interesting season, folks. We're in a season where we need to take advantage of the simple fact that I can publicly carry my Bible anywhere in the United States and not be persecuted for it. That I can openly talk to anyone I want, as long as it's public property, about Jesus Christ. I can wear a Christian t-shirt. I can put a, a, a he greater than I bumper sticker and not get pounded or sent to jail for that. We are living in this time, and I believe Paul understood that. He understood we need to redeem a time because there will be a time when some of this will be unlawful. You won't be able to do that. Redeem the time. Make the most of every opportunity that you and I have. The days are evil. If we look around to those things, one day Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for the church. There's a song by uh, Crystal Lewis. It says, people get ready, Jesus is coming, soon we'll be going home. People get ready, Jesus is coming, to take from this world his own. People get ready. Jesus is coming for us. And is he coming for us, are we going to be ready? Are we getting ready for him to come back for us? And some of you might be here today and thinking, what, what does that all mean? Seize the day. Take every opportunity wherever you go, Right? How many here go to other places other than your home and church? Right? How many here see other people throughout the week? Okay. All right. Some of you guys need to get out more. Okay. So you have this wonderful opportunity to talk to people, right? And it doesn't take much. I, 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 I got to do this. I, I dare you. Mm, I double dare you. To go outside those doors, there's a harvest crusade, there's flyers like this, right? And I put out some eternity tracks. I dare you. Don't be a chicken. Bawk, 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 bawk. No, 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 I'm joking. But I dare you, pick one up and give it to someone, a total stranger. Don't give it to your mom. Don't give it to your dog. Give it to someone you've never met before, right? Seize the opportunity. Seize the day. Can I tell you how easy it is? Say, how easy is it? Ask me. This easy. So, how you doing, sir? Good. Did you get one of these? No. Oh, there you go. All right. How you doing, sir? Did you get one of these? No. Oh, there you go. Bam. Good. Was that difficult? 
Was that difficult? All right. So why do I, why do, I do that? Because there's a lot of people that are lost and broken, and they need hope. They need, they need Jesus. They need Jesus. And guess who gets to represent Jesus and give them Jesus? Who? Turn to the person next to you. You get to tell people about Jesus. Tell them that. You get to tell people about Jesus. All right. And I love this. Verse 10, and when they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were with him went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. The door was shut. The wise who had their oil and their lanterns entered in. It kind of tells you what's going to happen with the foolish, right? You kind of know where this is going. The wise versus the foolish. And as I start to think about this, remember the point is preparedness. The point is being ready for Christ's return. Yes, check yourself. Make sure you're of the beloved. Make sure you're walking with the Lord. At the same time, seize the day. Make the most of every opportunity God has given you. But the other thing that comes to my mind is uh, no one left behind. I think all throughout Greek history and mythology and even the French Indian War, this, this term came about, leaving no one behind. Anyone here have unsaved family and friends? Don't leave them behind. Don't leave them behind. There are many people that need to hear that. There's people who are lost, who are broken, who are held captive. Check this out. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the mind of believers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ who is the image of God. It's, it's a tragic but accurate depiction of the state of our world today. This is without hope and without the God that we serve, right? We need to understand and believe scriptures in its description of people. When it comes to salvation, there's no such thing as a plan B. The plan A is that you would go tell it. That's it. How will they know unless you go? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards who? Towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God is faithful to keep his promises, isn't he? He's the best promise keeper. But also, not only that, he is long-suffering. He suffers long. Did the Lord suffer long with you before you came to Christ? I think for the Lord, like, come on now. Man, time's a wasting, right? Aren't you so glad that he waited? Right? Aren't you so glad that, that how many of you are happy that Jesus didn't return 10 years ago? Because you might not be here, right? How many glad he didn't return five years ago because he wouldn't be here? How many glad he didn't return two years ago because he wouldn't be here, right? Think about that. Because he waited, because he was patient, because he was loving, you entered in. You had the oil. You were ready, ready for his return. And not willing that any should perish. And I love this passage because it, it reveals God's glorious heart, his big heart for people. As we know the story of Jonah, I'm going to hit you hard with this, okay? You may be a Jonah in this room. God is prompting you to go tell someone, a group of people, your family, but you're running. You're a runner. And maybe today, God's saying, do my will, belly of a great fish. Choose. And for many of you, like myself, it stinks in the belly of a fish. And then I begin to stink. Then I become miserable. And when I'm not in the will of God, my heart becomes hardened. But I love this, guys. God always wins. So you can run, but you can't run very far. And he'll bring you back. And his will will be accomplished in our lives. Peter, as he's stating this, it's really Jesus' heart for the world, right? 
that none would perish, that he would have this compassion towards the people, that his love towards mankind is that they would all be saved. Uh, my brothers, my sisters, family, um, let's help others be ready for the bridegroom coming home. Let's help others be ready with the oil in their lanterns. Let's help others uh, be ready to speak uh, uh, to their maker, to their creator. You know, and, and some of you here today, you might be saying, well, that's, not, that's just not my gift. You know, but if you tell me to do this, I'll do this. But I'll tell you this. There's a scripture that I absolutely love in Romans chapter 10. It says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. How will they know unless you and I go? And in the context of people that we know, maybe you have a relationship with people and they're not believers, they're not walking with the Lord. You would love for them to come to church with you one day, but right now they're not. And you're debating, should I say something? Should I not say something? Well, I'd rather be the one who spoke too much as opposed to the one who didn't say anything at all. My brothers and sisters, may we be a people, may we be a church that speaks often about our God. That we could have but help speak for the love of Christ compels us, it constrains us. That I can't help talking about Jesus. That even the laws and the rules of the world try to confine us, correct? But you just can't help yourself. Last year we went on a mission trip to India. And in India we're not allowed to evangelize at all. And that's really challenging for some of us. We can't pass out tracts. We can't have a Christian t-shirt. You cannot represent Christ at all. And that's where we really just have to have our little light shine so bright where people would see Jesus. So our guide, we're at the train station. Our guide's, guide says, okay, you, you just sit down and you maintain yourself. And you, don't, you can't make a ruckus because there's Hindu radicals. And the Hindu radicals, if they see you're trying to share uh, the gospel or convert people, they'll come and pounce you and do all these crazy things. So we didn't. Well, we're waiting at the train station, and I see these three boys coming from after school, 10, 11, 12 years old, and I see them, and I make eye contact with them. You know how that is, folks? You make eye contact with somebody, right? And they look back at you, and I kind of smile, and, and the Spirit of God's like, do something. No, I can't. There's a rule. I have to obey. I'm the leader, right? Uh, and I'm standing there, and they keep looking at me, and it's like, oh, duh, duh, duh. I'm trying to ignore, and then you look back, and I look at you, and they're on the railroad tracks walking, and it's like, ah. If I've ever had a, a, a battle, that was one time I, ha- I, I sensed a battle. Obey man, obey God. And what do you think I did? I obeyed God, right? So I go, and we had these little wireless bracelets, like, come here. And I'm sitting on the edge of the railroad tracks, and they're coming by, and I'm like, okay, the, the, the red represents Jesus. And I don't know if they even understand me. This represents the blood of Christ. This is representative of sin. This is representative of that, right? And all I hear is, Pastor Dennis. Uh, yes, Brother Sam. Our guide calls us back. And he says, you know, we shouldn't do that, this and that. You know you're the leader, right? Yeah, I know I'm the leader. I know. It's not a good example. I know, right? But I said, Brother Sam, I just, I had to. I had to seize the opportunity because those kids are lost. I need the hope of heaven. You know what? There's a lot of kids out there. And I'm not talking about age. There's a lot of God's creation outside these walls who are hurting, who are dying, who need the love of Christ. That you and I have this wonderful opportunity to share with them who he is. And I'll tell you this. If you are in a spiritual rut, if if you're maybe in a desert, maybe if in your heart it's like, man, it's gotten hardened. I used to love doing that stuff and now I don't. The best thing you could do yourself is tell people about Jesus. Tell them how much uh, he loves them how much uh, that he yearns for them to live that right relationship. Because I do know this, and this is something that 
uh, across the board. The more and more I share the gospel, the more and more I believe it. Is that not true? Some of you have jobs where you do the same thing all the time you could do in your sleep, and you believe it. You'll bank your life on it. How much more the gospel, how much more the Bible, the things of God, that we should live our lives according to those things. I pray that the message that we preach would enable others to be prepared for heaven. The wise and the foolish, that last verse there basically says, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour which the Son of Man is coming. He's coming soon. And with that in mind, I pray that all of us, number one, that you're ready to meet your maker. Number two, that you're making the most, seizing the day, making the most of every opportunity in your life. And number three, that we don't leave anyone behind. The worst thing that we could ever hear is someone say, you never told me. You never told me. Why didn't you tell me? My brothers and sisters, it's time for us to rise. It's time for us to stand. Enough sitting. We do need to do more standing. We need to do more speaking. And not in our own strength. Get, let me just tell you. Remember, it's the oil. It's the spirit. It's the spirit of God intermingled with the word of God that people would know truth. And truth would set them free. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this day that you've allowed us to have. And thank you for your word. And your word shows us how to live and how to conduct ourselves. And I pray even now, God, that you would continue to speak to us. That we would be a people that always choose you first. That we would be a people that live for eternity. That are not merely prepared for your coming but we're ready to be ready in season and out of season to preach the gospel, to love on people, to have them see you in the midst of all things. And so, God, you know each of us in this building, in this, this, this church right now, and you know our hearts. And, and, God, I just pray, Lord, if there be anyone here who does not know you, that they would say yes to you tonight, that tonight would be the night of salvation for some. And yet at the same time, there are some here, God, that need to stand for you, that they know that you've called them to be an ambassador of your love. Maybe not a preacher, maybe not an evangelist, but an ambassador, a representative of you, where they live and where they work. And God, would you give us that boldness? Would you give us that courage to live how you desire us to live. And so church, uh, I just want to ask, maybe for some of you today, tonight, um, you're a believer and, and you know God's calling you to minister and to be a witness and to love on people. But for whatever reason, maybe there's fear or maybe there's anxiety or maybe there's just certain things in your life that are preventing you from that. And you know God's been prompting your heart and you don't want to be a Jonah anymore. And you want to go forth. You want to go forth and be a light in the midst of this darkness. You know, for you tonight, I'm going to ask you just to stand so we might lay hands and pray for you. If, if you're here tonight and you want to stand for Christ, stand for what you believe in in this world, just stand to your feet. Go ahead and stand to your feet right now. Anyone? Perfect. Anyone else? Just stand that you just know God's calling you. Awesome. As you're standing, realize that God's telling you specifically. He's giving you some instructions, and, and you know what those instructions are. And, and I ask that you would follow through. If you're around someone who's standing, just lay your hand upon them. If you're around someone who's standing, look around, look around, and just lay your hand upon that brother or that sister. And we're just going to pray over them, that God would give them his words, give them his heart. Father God, you know those that are standing, those that desire to make a difference in our world. Those who know your return is soon. So Father, we pray for the anointing of your spirit to you upon them. We, in a sense, commission them to go out, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, God. We 
pray now that they would be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in them. That they themselves would not only be ready, but prepare others to be ready for your return, God. We pray for all of us to be wise versus foolish, God. So for these, God, we ask now for a spirit of boldness to come upon them, God. Loosen their tongues, God. Anything within their lives that is paralyzed, would you bring back to life, God? That they would be used for your kingdom and your glory. God, thank you so much for their lives. Send them forth. Send them forth, God. We love you so much, Lord, and we pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.